Okay, so now that we've gone ahead and discussed uh, absor absorption costing and variable costing, let's take a look at the difference, uh, and we're going to focus now on the second part of our chapter, capacity analysis. Now, given the firm's level of spending on fixed manufacturing costs, what capacity level should we use to compute the fixed manufacturing cost per unit? Because we've seen the difference uh, in operating income arises solely from the treatment of fixed manufacturing costs. And how much and how we compute fixed manufacturing costs per unit uh, uh, for the number of units uh, that we are producing. So, what is the right level of capacity that we should be using? What is the right fixed cost per unit? Because we've so far we developed we we've taken our fixed manufacturing costs that we've incurred divided by the number of units produced to get our budgeted uh, fixed manufacturing cost per unit. But remember, if we but think about capacity. If we have too much capacity, then we have the cost of unused capacity because we're paying for capacity we're not planning on using. If we have too little capacity, what does that mean? Then, then uh, we may not be able to satisfy all customer orders. Uh, we may uh, be consider, con consistently selling out not having enough not being able to make enough units so when we talk about capacity we're talking about constraint or upper limit so the choice of the capacity level used to allocate budget and fixed manufacturing overhead costs will greatly affect operating income so let's going to take a look at now at the different capacity levels we have four different capacity levels theoretical capacity practical capacity normal ca capacity for utilization and master budget capacity utilization, and let's look at the and look at these individually. Theoretical capacity is capacity based on producing at full efficiency all the time, no downtime, nothing, no no plant maintenance, no shutdown periods, no interruption because of downtime in the assemblies. Now, theoretical capacity in the real world unattainable. But they represent the ideal goal of capacity utilization a company can aspire to. We always want to improve uh, how much we can produce. We always want to increase how much we can produce with what we already have. Uh, we want to, uh, we do want to uh, reduce the amount of interruption because of the downtime in the assembly line. So we always want to improve, but the theoretical capacity in the real world is really unattainable. Practical capacity will take the theoretical capacity and reduce it by unavoidable operating incomes like maintenance, scheduled maintenance, shutdown for holidays, things like that. So both theoretical capacity and practical capacity is based on supply, what we can supply to the market. The next two levels are going to be based on demand, demand from the market. And normal capacity utilization uh, is simply the goal or the amount of utilization that satisfies average customer demand over a period long enough can be considered seasonal, cyclical, trend factors, things like that. And this can be over two or three different years. Whereas master budget capacity is the level of capacity that we're talking about only for the current budget period, which you know, we typically think of that as one year. So let's take a look here, and based on which level of capacity, what we're going to budget fixed manufacturing costs per unit. Let's say that for the company, uh, and that's Stass and Company we looked at in the book, if we budge, if we calculate theoretical capacity, assuming no downtime, no shutdowns, no holidays, no breakdowns of machinery, we could produce 18,000 units. If I take my fixed manufacturing cost of $1,080,000 and spread that out over 18,000 units, I'm going to get a budgeted fixed manufacturing cost of $60 per unit. However, I can't really attain that in the real world. So I'm going to look at practical capacity, which reduces theoretical capacity by plant shutdowns uh, for holidays, um, scheduled maintenance, and so forth. If I take those same and budgeting for that, let's say I budget for all that downtime, maintenance, things like that, and I can only produce 12,000 units. 
I should, and I'm budgeting for 12,000 units, then I can, then when I get my cost per unit, and let me get my pointer here. Practical capacity says I can only produce 12,000 units. So if I take my $1,080,000, spread that out over 12,000 units, I'm going to get a fixed manufacturing cost per unit of $90. Let's say the normal capacity of average customer demand over two or three years is for 10,000 units produced. If I take my $1,080,000, spread that out over 10,000 units produced, I'm going to have a fixed manufacturing cost of $108 per unit. And then finally, if I'm only budgeting for 8,000 units this period or this year, fixed manufacturing cost spread out over 8,000 units is going to be $135 per unit. You can already see the difference in product cost per unit. And when we have the difference in product cost per unit, that's going to directly affect our income statement and our balance sheet. And not only our income statement, our balance sheet, but it's also going to influence the production volume variance. Production volume variance, we would expect it to be higher under or highest under theoretical capacity and lowest under either normal or master budget capacity, whichever is the lower number here. My uh, production volume variance should be the lowest under the lowest capacity and level that we're budgeting for. In this case, master budget capacity, but it could be that normal capacity utilization could have the uh, could have the lowest production volume variance as well. So when we're choosing capacity level, it's going to be why are we choosing that? Why are we making that choice of capacity level? What is going to drive us to pick one over the other? Well, one, product costing and capacity management pricing, performance evaluation, external reporting, and then maybe tax requirements as well. So we want to take all of those into consideration when we're choosing which denominator level capacity we're going to use for budgeted fixed manufacturing costs per unit. Now, for most decisions, product costing and capacity management using practical capacity as their denominator level sets the cost of capacity and the cost of supplying capacity regardless of the demand for capacity. So this is probably the best unit or the best way to, uh, best measurement of capacity is practical capacity for product costing and capacity management. Why? Because it highlights the cost of capacity acquired but not used. And when we highlight that, we can direct managers' attention to how can we manage this unused capacity. Um, in contrast, either the, using either of the capacity levels based on demand, whether it's the master budget, budget uh, utilization or normal capacity, it hides that amount of unused capacity. So for budgeting, capacity management, product costing, we want to use practical capacity. Theoretical capacity, doesn't, you know, it's not attainable in the real world. Practical capacity also allows us to highlight the cost of unused capacity so we can better manage a capacity. Demand has nothing, uh, it hides the amount of unused capacity, and we really don't see that. And remember, the, uh, when we're talking about the cost of unused capacity, we're talking about the fixed manufacturing cost per unit times the difference of, uh, times the number of the difference between practical capacity and actual output. So, and let me, uh, let's see. And let's see, unused. Capacity. And that's what we want to focus on here. And that's the difference between practical capacity and actual capacity, how much we actually produce, the difference between the two, multiplied by the fixed manufacturing cost per unit. So when we're making pricing decisions, 
our choice of capacity can also lead us to making irrational decisions. For example, the downward demand spiral. It's a condition is when demand keeps decreasing, keeps decreasing, and when we do not meet competitors' pricing, for let's say our competitor, or let's say demand is down because someone undercuts us in, in the selling price to the to the market, then if we do not lower our price and match our competitors, what happens? Demand for products goes even further. And then it keeps going further, and then it keeps going further. So our demand keeps getting less and less and less. So for practical uh, practical capacity, more stable measure because it measures capacity, uh, fixed cost rate is based on capacity available rather than capacity used to meet demand. Because if we're using capacity used, if we're using this part here, if we're using to make our pricing decisions based on master budget capacity utilization, what we're planning on selling this period, that's where my fixed budget manufacturing costs are the highest. So if I'm making pricing decisions based on this higher amount, am I going to be more or less likely to reduce my selling price as uh, as competitors take market share and lower their prices? Well, I'm probably going to be less likely because I'm, I'm fixated on this $135 amount when I really should be focusing on this practical capacity of $90 per unit. So now when we're talking about performance evaluation, unused capacity adds cost of products because now we've got to account for that capacity not used. Now, mid-level managers will have control over these costs, but do have some control over prices. So let's ask, should the marketing manager be held accountable for manufacturing overhead costs unrelated to potential customer base? No. Or do we want to make sure we're focusing on who's responsible for the cost, the controllability level of the cost, like we talked about in, perform in uh, responsibility accounting a couple chapters ago. We want to focus on who is responsible and holding them responsible for what they are actually responsible for and not for things outside of their control. Now, when there are large differences between practical capacity and master budget capacity, that's planned unused capacity because we're planning on maintaining that level of capacity. We're not going to reduce it. So we're planning on that unused capacity. Because if we weren't planning, if we were trying to control capacity, then we would lower the amount of capacity that we could use. So we wouldn't have that excess and fixed costs. With financial accounting, uh, and financial reporting. Again, we talked about the production volume variance under absorption costing is going to be affected by the choice of denominator level. Um, the production volume variance, we can dispose of that in three ways. Remember, we talked about this in job costing in Chapter 4. When we're talking about uh, over allocation of overhead, we can do this with the production volume variance as well by the adjusted allocation rate, proration approach, where we spread it out to work in process, to finish goods and cost of goods sold, or the amount is immaterial in nature, we can just directly write it off to cost of goods sold. Now, when we're trying to choose the method to dispose of the production volume variance, um, we want to write off the portion of variance that represents the cost capacity not used to support the production of output units produced during the period so which one better represents uh what when one of these methods which one better represents the actual cost of capacity not used in building that in we, we want to focus that so we want to choose that method that allows us to highlight um the co cost of capacity not used and the more we're the more capacity we have that we're not using, the more expenses we're incurring, manufacturing costs that we're incurring that we don't have to incur. So there may be some times where we need to right to uh, right size our capacity, especially when we see large production volume variances being closed out. Then we might want to consider: should we continue to have that same level of capacity? or maybe downsize our level of capacity to right fit so we're not incurring all those extra costs. 
Now, for tax requirements in the U.S., IRS requires uh, inventoryable indirect production costs by method allocation, which fairly, quote unquote, fairly apportions costs to the very items produced. So it'll take either overhead rate, standard costs, uh, um, volume variances, uh, production volume variances uh, can be deducted for tax purposes and either costs are incurred. Um, but the IRS wants to, uh, for tax purposes, we need to be using practical capacity in order to calculate budget and fixed manufacturing costs. Um, so for the IRS standpoint, we need to use practical capacity as well, as we also saw from uh, earlier, just a few minutes ago, practical capacity allows us to focus on uh, cost of capacity not used. So we really want to, uh, for most of our decision-making uh, uh situations we want to use practical capacity how much can we produce and remember practical capacity reduces theory theoretical capacity by unavoidable things such as holidays shutdowns things like that so things some other things we should take into account for capacity um what about the level of uncertainty between expected costs and expected demand presence of capacity related issues in non-manufacturing settings and then maybe we want to use some activity-based costing techniques in allocating capacity costs as well and we don't really touch on this in this chapter so we but we can use some of this for activity-based costing as well so in our exercises uh, we will highlight we'll have two exercise videos we will highlight absorption costing and variable costing as well as we will also highlight uh, the different levels of capacity as well. So this is Leroy Meadows. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day.